All right, so uh, next up, we're going to learn why people are more important than code. So give Joanna a warm welcome. All right. Um, oh, okay. Try to, hopefully it'll, everything will, will stay the way it's supposed to. So I li always like to give credit where credit is due. Um, this is originally inspired by Andrea Goulet, who is the CEO of Corgi Bytes. Corgi Bytes is a, a company that's semi-local to me. They love to deal in legacy code. It's like their thing. They just love it, and I <laughs> think they're weird, but they're great. And anyway, she, she gave a speech. Um, communication is just as important as code. Um, this just takes it a little bit further. Um, it's also inspired by Indy Young uh, in her book, Practical Empathy. Um, I've not made it yet all the way through it. It's a little dry, but it's really good stuff. And Sheila Southall is my mentor. Um, and they've all inspired me, so I just wanted to, to do that. Okay. All right. Searching for source. All right. The next picture is a beautiful picture of where I'm from. <laughs> You just have to trust me on that one. Um, we'll let TJ work his magic. So I grew up in a little teeny town in the mountains. Um, couldn't wait to get out of there. You know, there was nobody there. Um, went to college. Ended up in kind of a small city, Harrisonburg, Virginia, which is just southwest of, of D.C. <laughs> it doesn't do it just to me. Um, we're James and Madison University is where we are. So if you guys can kind of familiar, familiarize yourself with that. Um, <laughs> at, there's like 50,000 people in our town, so it's not real big. When JMU's in session, that adds another 20,000 students. So we're, the university surrounds pretty much everything that we do. Um, this is Blue Ridge uh, Parkway, so we've got great places to see foliage and um, things. So that's just a little bit about, about me. Um, okay. We can just do, I guess, whatever it likes. It's not as <laughs> um, so I'll just, I'll just tell you a little about myself, a little bit more. I'm the director of operations for Emerge. Emerge um, started from a bunch of JMU college students, and they were working in immersive technology. That's where Emerge comes from. Um, and years ago, our corporate company McClung Printing was in that, is print going to die? What's going to happen? Uh, that was about 12 years ago. And so they renovated enough and they were like, you know what? Let's buy a web company. So if I touch this, if it's going to, all right. So, so we're owned by McClung. They're a, a commercial printer. They do everything from postcards, flyers, to promotional materials. They also have a mailing house do Pearl campaigns, direct mail, and all of that. We're just the digital arm of that. We actually have kind of our own little location. We get to do our own thing. <laughs> um, and they're, they're located about 45 minutes away from us. Um, but I like that they're innovative. And they're a print company, and they've been in business for 70 years. But they're innovative. And they're like, hey, you guys are at the forefront. Let's, let's do some different things. Um, so I, my degree is in English. Um, I started out writing technical training for government agencies, Fortune 500 companies. Back when government agencies, everybody had to have a BlackBerry, right? And guides on how to use a BlackBerry. <laughs> I just aged myself. Um, <laughs> incredibly. Um, <laughs> but we did like Microsoft Suite, Lotus Notes, all that, SharePoint, all that good stuff. I didn't know how to use any of those programs, so I taught myself how to use them did graphic design layout, training materials. We did online learning. I had to write questions. How do you make your paragraph formatted? You know, all that kind of fun stuff. So um, went from there to a web design company. And that's where I got into web. And it was a, a magical moment for me when I realized that when I made a typo, it was not printed 10,000 times <laughs> over in a print run. I could correct it very quickly on the web. <laughs> So that was kind of, that was nice. I had started, at that agency, they used Joomla. Joomla 1.7, I think. It's pretty awful. Um, and so when I came in to Emerge in 2013, they were working in Expression Engine, and they showed it to me. And I was like, this is incredible. <laughs> I was so excited. Um, so I came to Emerge as an administrator. Um, 
moved to project manager, moved to director of project management, and moved to director of operations. I, one of the things that I struggle with is that working in technology, and I'm not a coder, and I even like disqualified myself a number of times um, because of that. And you know, I went to this project management class, which is a general project management class. Our instructor, she'd worked for IBM, I think, for 20 years. She started as like a receptionist and worked her way up to a project manager. And she, she, had, she had said, you know, I had an, a, a software engineer come up to me and say, why should I listen to you? You don't know how to code. And I was like, yeah, exactly. Why? Why? Tell me. Tell me. I want to know. And she said, she asked the engineer, she said, do you want to talk to people every single day? Do you want to call the client? Do you want to tell them you're over budget? Do you want to tell them they need more money? Do you want them to interrupt you every single day? And he's like, no. And she said, okay, that's why you're going to listen to me, because I'm willing to do that. And if you can't or aren't, and that was for me, it was like, oh, I have a really valuable role in this, even though I don't know how to code. So. Um, it was when I, that was when I really realized that everybody's, those skills that everyone calls soft are really essential skills. And I, I, I think we should try to figure out how to way to not call those soft skills anymore. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so along the way, what I've learned is that every person is valuable. Every person who the technology touches, the person who pays for it, the person who builds it, the person who uses it. Um, technology is supposed to make us better. On the next slide, I just I got a little ahead of myself. Um, but to consider the perspective of each, um, which I think is probably one of the most challenging things that you can deal with. Um, people are your greatest asset. Um, the clients, it's their vision, it's their money, it's their business. You know, they have a lot on the line, but it's your developers it's their vision. It's their blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> it's their time. It's their, their, um, their heart and soul sometimes. And those often conflict. <laughs> and then we can't forget about the end user because they also probably have different, um, a different perspective than, than either of the other two parties. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'll give you an example of, of a situation for us. We had a a client come to us, they wanted us to rebuild their e-commerce system. They had an antiquated accounting software system that pushed things to a web site of sort that pushed their product. You could sort of order, but you couldn't. It was all integrated in this non-supported accounting system. And so we interviewed all of the staff. We went through and we followed their product all the way through their lines and everything. And their main buyer kept telling me, she kept saying, I don't really have like a stake in this. I don't. I don't need to contribute anything. Like you know, talk to everyone else. And we kept saying, no, 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 no. You have got to because once we found out, once we got her to buy in and said, no, we need your opinion. We need your insight. Like there, half of their buying process and their processes were only they only existed in her head. No one else knew anything about what else was going on. And if we hadn't have pushed the issue with her. For her insight, we wouldn't have gained the knowledge. We would have lost all of that. Maybe recommended or built a system that didn't actually serve their needs. Um, but I'll go back to fight fiercely for all sides. That's, that's what I think my job is. Like, I fight for my clients. I'll fight for my devs. I'll fight for the end user. I'll fight my staff, whoever. And it's, it's always a give and take. Who's going to be a little happier that day? <laughs> But everyone is a stakeholder, if you really think about it. If you've got your people buying in, you've got your clients buying in. Um, so this goes back to Angela, Andrea Goulet. Empathy is, is a big part of this. Um, and I'll just read this quote. When we put empathy at the center of our technology, human connection becomes stronger. Infusing empathy throughout your organization and development strategy can have profound positive impact on customer loyalty employee retention, and vendor service. And then I have another quote, a little bit longer. This is Andy Young. I thought this was really insightful about how we look at the world. Um, not necessarily just even about business. The empathetic mindset is about being curious, 
open to learning what's going through other people's minds. It's about focusing on understanding another person's perspective and experience of the world. It's specifically about letting go of the urge to have answers or solve problems for that person. The last part gets me every time. <laughs> solve problems for that person. It's easy to have the answer. It's easy to say, I know what you need. I have the fix. Um, but I think if you, if you can say, we can solve the problem together, you're going you're gonna to have a lot better buy-in. And what I mean by that is, you can hand a client a solution, and it can be elegant, and it can be great, and it can be cost-effective, and it can check all the boxes, but if they don't understand it, and if they don't think it's valuable, it doesn't solve their problem because they're not going to use it, or they're not going to pay for it, or they're not going <clears> to <throat> invest in it. Um, the biggest thing about empathy is it involves listening, and I think that's another essential skill, we'll call them, that um, we can all hone. Um, it's one of the more challenging things, I think, that we deal with. Um, so, let's see. So, I've been doing this for a while, at least 10 years. Um, and I learned the hard way on a lot of these. <laughs> like, I get a call from my sales guy. He's in another room. He's like, president and the client are screaming at each other. What do I do? I'm like, I'm not in the, I don't know. What do we do? <laughs> uh, just duck and hide until we can figure out. <laughs> that was a project that we, we lost quite a bit of money on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That one, that project, ugh, still to this day kind of makes me cringe. Um, but anyway, I learned, I learned the, hard, the hard way. So I'm just going to share these, take them for what they are. They are tips. They don't work for everybody, but these are the things that we've seen work for us. Um, body language. Body language and tone of voice, not words, are our most powerful assessment tools. Christopher Voss is a hostage, former hostage negotiator. Um, we like to because we do regional work and all of our workers are um, local. We like to have people, our first meeting with our clients in person, if we can. Um, we've traveled, you know, days to have them there. We actually did a meeting where half our team went, half our team stayed, and we kind of played that out. There were people in the meeting who actually left the meeting, and the, the, those of us who stayed behind, we didn't even know they left from the client. We couldn't tell the body language, we couldn't tell who was, who was you know, disinterested, who was confused, but you get so much of those, you know, arm crossed, I'm not going to buy in, or I'm not interested, or like we literally had a client fall asleep one time, <laughs> like she was out, <laughs> and her, her contact person, was her marketing manager just kept elbowing her, um, but we, we, we got all of that because we saw them in person, and it's not always feasible, I know it's not, especially now, now. but if you can do a video, you can at least make a human connection. Like you can make eye contact with a person and you can be like, oh, there's a person on the other end. And when I say things that maybe aren't so great, there's a person on the other end. <laughs> um, but I think that it just speaks into humanizing what we do. Okay, so this one, this I thought found this very interesting. When interests don't coincide. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Adam Grant. I was listening to his podcast, Work Life Balance. It's really good. Um, he interviews Christopher Voss, who we, we, I referred to, who spent many years as a hostage negotiator. So <laughs> I know that kind of seems a little melodramatic, that <laughs> a hostage situation. But if any of you have been in a really, really hostile client situation, you feel that. You feel that pressure. You feel, what is going to happen? Am I going to get sued? Are they going to pull the plug on a 50 grand project? I mean, we had a half million dollar project. The client was calling me on Sunday mornings trying to get this thing launched. And it was like that. <laughs> it was a kind of tense situation. But Chris Foss says that hostage negotiation is really about setting boundaries. And that's, that's really all, it, all, all of that is. And that's really what communication and project management and dealing with people is setting the boundaries and setting those kind of things, one of the tactics he uses is called forced empathy. And it makes the other party look at your situation. So if somebody's asking for something completely unrealistic, 
instead of saying, no, that, that's unrealistic, you're being ridiculous, you know, ask them, how am I supposed to do that? And in a very calm way, asking them how they're supposed to do that, because they're probably already on the defensive and ready for you to say no, or ready for you to argue. If you can kind of disengage that, that hostile uh, feeling by saying, how am I supposed to do that? They have to think, well, how is this guy gonna do that? Now you're probably, you might get met with, I don't care, I don't know, doesn't matter, you figure it out. But you can at least try that. It's a tactic, it doesn't work for everybody. Um, it's one of the things that I've done like, okay, I gotta go into the situation. I gotta get my, calm myself down, ground myself before I go in there. Because my first instinct is to say, my team did not mess up. You are, are just being unrealistic. You are being unreasonable. And in their mind, they're absolutely not being unreasonable because they don't understand what they got. They don't understand what they bought. They don't feel like they got what they want, whether they did or not. So um, I just think it's, a, it's an interesting way of looking at, at that. Um, I experienced a very similar situation to this where the client was just really, really unhappy to the point where one of my developers was like, you know what, I'm gonna take a long lunch because I don't wanna be in the building when they come here. Like, I'm afraid of them. And I was like, all right, that's a little dramatic, but you know, go take lunch, okay. <laughs> and you know, the point of contact, she just was really, really angry and to the point of just on and on. And it was a rocky project, but you know, we, from my perspective, I thought we fulfilled it. And she just, for about, it was our president, my project coordinator, a bunch of people from their office. And she just was on and on and on, about an hour, just kind of berating us. And at that point, you can't really defend, you just sort of have to let them get it out of their system. And what I love is their CEO said, all right, I have heard enough. He stopped it and I was like, okay, and he said, all right, tell me three things. What can you do? What won't you do? And what can you do? And in 10 minutes, we had negotiated the, the problem and we said, we can do this, we won't do this, and we're gonna look into seeing if we're able to do this. And then we moved on. And it was like that, those three things, those, I love those, that we've used those quite frequently. What can you do, what won't you do, and what can't you do? And you know, it, it begins, his, his thought was, all right, I understand there are things you can't do that you won't do, and maybe I'll fight you on the things you won't do, you know? And um, we actually, we, amazingly enough, still have them as a client. It might be temporary, but we still have them. <laughs> um, so contracts. Um, we used to have pretty terrible contracts, like we had a contract spec on a napkin once. Um, we hired a lawyer. We hired a lawyer who actually is not a, a technology lawyer. We hired somebody who actually does construction contracts. Building a house, very similar. You can't just change the specs, the scope on a house after you've already built the foundation on it. So he understood the principles and he was able to say, okay, now I can take that. Here are the things that you need to do to protect yourself. And he translated that for us, for all of our terms. Um, Building a little bit of hidden flexibility in there so that you can be a good guy, you can be a hero when you want to, um, is nice. I will caution you about saying yes, though. <laughs> I don't know if anybody is familiar with this book. One of my developers always says this, if you give a mouse a cookie, they're gonna want a glass of milk. If you give the client this, they're gonna want the next thing. And so it is a very delicate balancing act. Sometimes you gotta say yes, but you gotta think about when I say yes, what does that mean? We had somebody ask for something, it was so, it was ridiculous. It was like they wanted a button changed. And it broke the entire CSS on something because they had done, I don't even know what it was. <laughs> I don't, I don't I honestly, I don't know what the developer did that, that day. Um, but you have to think about the windfall effects of that one button change, really, it was a five minute change, but it was a two hour fix to fix the CSS that everything else had gotten destroyed because of that five minute button change. The button that we had built was scoped, it was exactly what we said, it was what they had approved in our mockups, but when we were nice and we made that, we had to do that. And it's really hard to explain to them, hey, that button that we said we'd do for free, now you gotta pay for? No, we just had to eat that, so. Um, 
one of the things that I think is really valuable that I've done with my team, especially my developers who aren't real comfortable talking to people, or they're just getting better at that, some of my junior web devs, um, don't say no and don't say yes. It's not your job. You take it in. You can say, well, let me look into that. I'm going to ask the project coordinator. Project coordinator is going to go back to that contract and going to say, are we safe? Do we scope it well enough? She's going to say that. So they don't feel like they have to be the bad guy, and they don't feel like they have to be a hero in that situation. So from, from us, they're like, absolutely, I'm taking that note down. I'm going to check into that for you, and our project coordinator is going to get back to you tomorrow and find out what we can do. So it, it really frees them from feeling nervous in those situations because they're really just showing the client and explaining the technology. Listen to your instincts. Um, I think this is really, really valuable, especially the more experience you get. You know when a project is going off the rails. You get that feeling in the pit of your stomach and there is nothing, you know it, absolutely. And if you don't, you haven't been doing it long enough. <laughs> um, I, my project managers and my CSR, if they, if, if they come to me and they say, I think this, this client, we got to talk to them, they're going off the road, something's happening, I'm like, absolutely, let's get them on the phone. If she tells me that, she talks to them every single day, I'm going to listen to her because her instincts are really good. Um, and my developers, I have train them. If you think something is just going to be ridiculous and hard and you have a, a gut feeling about it, tell me. Don't wait until after the fact. Like, tell me I'm wrong, please. And um, it's not always easy when they do that, but, <laughs> but it really gives you better results. If you, if you can have that kind of trust relationship with your team where you're like, you know, you, you can say that's a ridiculous idea in a very kind way. <laughs> Um, it's much better. We teach our sales and customer service to assume the first posture that there's a breakdown in communication, not somebody screwed up. We will not throw our developers under the bus, not ever. I will defend them fiercely. I will also go to them and say, look, the client is asking for this, and I know you think this is ridiculous, but listen to me. They are a client, they are writing a check, <laughs> and we have to do this. So again, it's that balancing act. Um, and just looking out for both sides. Um, this one's hard. I think this is the hardest thing. <laughs> Try to ignore the snarky comments that people make. Um, and I have heard a lot of them. Um, <clears throat> I had uh, one client say, you know, I'm not a coder, but that really shouldn't take very long. <laughs> And that was somebody who had like, they had like a four module accreditation process. And they're like, you know, we want to change it from four to two cycles. You just change that around, right? You just put a couple lines in and really trying to explain to her, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I've had people say they won't pay for my time as a project manager, but they would pay for the developer. That was a lawyer, it was a little hard to argue with her. Um, <laughs> I had a client say, could you ask your, your designer to use the PHP to fix this design? That made my lead designer really mad. Um, which brings us back to don't always tell your team everything the client says. <laughs> Some of those things, file it away, take it to the grave. I really wish that the, my sales manager had not emailed me <clears throat> the email where my client said I was a wallflower. I was like, oh, yeah. Um, I actually had a developer tell a client in a meeting, I'm the expert. You should just listen to me and be quiet. Yeah. That one was not good. That was the problem child that we talked about yesterday. <laughs> um, but anyway, the list goes on. And I'm sure you've all heard those. There's rude things you, that people say. Um, we just have to, you have to think past that and push past those personal things and realize that there's probably just something they don't understand. Sometimes they're just being ridiculous and they want to invent because when it comes to spending money, that's when people get upset. Um, we do have a clause that we added to our contracts recently that if our clients are mistreating 
or abusing our staff, we have the right to terminate. It's in there, it's hidden. We've never had to do that. Um, but just in case it ever becomes a serious problem. Um, are, we, are we okay on time? <laughs> time investment. Um, emphasize the value of time. Um, this is for everyone. The client, I think, is, is one of the biggest things. Um, getting them to understand they need to invest in a project. That you're, they're not going to sign a check, sign a contract, and hand it to you and say, do it to me, and bring it back to me in six months, all complete. They realize they need to respond, they need to input, they need to test, they need to check, they need to um, approve. So that, that's one thing I think that it can be difficult because they think, I'm paying you, you do everything. And they don't realize that there is some investment of time. Depending on the project, it can be a lot of investment of time. Um, our developers, we calendar everything. So on the day, they get in in the morning, they block off, I'm working on this site for three hours. I'm, I'm on call for these three hours. I'm doing this. I have 12 meetings or whatever. <laughs> um, because they can look at their calendar and see what they have for the day. Other people on our team can look at their calendar and say, oh, I can't interrupt them because they've got a marathon coding session. And it's honoring each other's time and honoring your own time. And I have taught my team, you can tell me no if you're busy. You can tell me no because we can do it later. I mean, obviously, unless something's blown up. But it is, it, this is really important, um, empowering people to learn the value of their own time and giving them the power to say to other people on your team, I can't now, but I will later. Um, minimizing interruptions makes you so much more efficient and actually really a lot happier um, because you're able to focus and do the things that you need to do. Um, it took a while to get there. People didn't like it. They didn't like that. They wanted to just sort of switch gears when they wanted to and those kind of things. But we found we're so much more efficient when we do it that way. Um, it's not magic. I think this is a, a misnomer that a lot of people have who don't understand technology. Um, if you can articulate to your clients that it takes hard work and not magic, it gives more value to your work because they realize you are doing a lot of thinking, a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of things like that, not just, well, they just typed a few lines and it made it work. It's sort of the antithesis of what you think. If you tell them it's magic, yeah, it makes it seem mystical and it makes it seem some, like something they can't understand, but has the reverse effect. They don't value it because they're like, well, that's just magic. They can just turn it on. Um, so we, we don't like to use that phrase, it's magic. <laughs> Um, we have, on occasion, actually something that is um, a simple fix, done it and not told the client for a couple hours just so they understand that it isn't magic. Um, so, um, estimates, uh, this is a big thing for us. Once we sort of rounded the corner on estimating, um, made a big difference. We used to just sort of have our sales department do everything. Sales would bring in what the problem was, they would scope it, they would estimate it, hand, hand our development team a contract and say, fulfill this. It doesn't work very well. You get upset developers who are like, I get eight hours to do what? And you get a sales team who's like, just do it. <laughs> so what we did was we switched it. We said, developers, here's the problem. Tell me the solution and tell me how long it's going to take. And they said, here you go. Um, so we have like a big master spreadsheet we use for every project. It calculates project management on top of what the developers say. It calculates QA time on top of the developers because they're only thinking about the time they need. You tell me the time you need and I'll calculate everything else. Um, everyone's much happier that way. We use an 80% trick. We give our developers 80% of the budget and that's their goal. If we give them 100%, they're gonna use 100%. Um, so we use teamwork, we put the 80% budget in there. We hit it most of the time, unless we hit a bug. But you've got that 20% already in there for, um, for that. Using historical data is a really important thing too. Um, we will review projects. If something goes significantly over budget, they are required to write why it went over budget. There was a bug, plugin had a problem. 
this just took longer. We've never done this before. Or it's a different plugin. It takes longer to, in, you know, to design to uh, lay out mail ch uh, constant contact than Mailchimp in this page or something like that. You know, so we price them differently. Helps us with our next estimate. Um, tribal knowledge, not great. Um, document, document, document. Keep it somewhere. Keep it accessible, like a knowledge base. Uh, like I said, we use teamwork. You can search it for a million years. Um, I actually looked for a problem once on a help forum. It was an EE forum. My team had asked the question two years before and had gotten the answer and nobody documented it. <laughs> so we also have established SOPs um, that everyone follows. They're really, really valuable. Um, when we first did it, our team felt really restricted because they're like, you're telling me I have to follow the same process every time. Once they got into it and realized it's actually liberating to have a process written out because they don't have to think about it and they don't have to reinvent the wheel to get the solution they need. Now, how flexible and how tight you want those to be is, depends on the people that you work with. Um, theory of thirds. So our financial controller always talks about the theory of thirds. If you can get two out of three, you're good. Um, it's a balancing act. How happy is the client? Have you fulfilled the contract scope? Is your quality good? Is it what you would put your name on? Um, and then obviously money, the bottom line. Um, all three are important. And on every, any given project, one of those is probably going to suffer at any given point in time. And which one suffers the most? You have to make that decision. You know, a lot of times it's our bottom line that makes that. Um, because you want the quality to be good and the client to be happy. But sometimes if the client has gone off scope and changed that, then you have to look at, you have to look at it from everything. Um, last thing, these are just some quick things to try. Calendaring is a good thing. Um, you're also, you're more likely to finish when you plan. I am gonna plan to do this today and, and get it accomplished. PM software, what everyone works for you. We use several different things. We use Smartsheet. For our clients, um, instead of having them access our project management system, keeping those a little bit separate. Um, we've done Kanban boards. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Like the post-it notes, we literally have a post-it note board. We've done digital versions of those. The visual cues help a lot of people. Depends on if you're a visual learner or visual visually stimulated. Um, meetings, we record them as we can, and we try to have two people from our staff representing in a meeting so that one person's taking notes, one person's running. You don't have the client said, I think they said thing. You have two people that are, were listening to that. Um, be willing to change, um, have high expectations, but allow for failure. Um, the best thing that my company president ever said to me after a really big failure, he said, but did you learn? <laughs> So that, for me, was really great. Um, that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Yes. Right now, we're slimmed down. We've got four, four of us. We, we've had nine. We're in a, we're in a rebuilding year. <laughs> yes? Have you um, done any, just curious, like, understanding people, have you done any, like, people at work or disc or uh, we do. Our, our company actually does, before we hire, we do a behavioral analysis of every employee. And it, it, it's, uh, it's a real simple test. It's more of a word association and a description. Um, it tells us their vector scores of assertiveness, um, uh, calmness, conformity, and sociability. And so we typically use that to see if it fits the role. But I use that also after the fact for managing, managing people with different personalities and things like that. High social people versus non-social people and how you manage them together. We look at that and we, we check those scores quite frequently and review those kind of things. It is very helpful. I think it's very helpful, especially if there's a conflict and you can't really understand if it's, um, it's, it's obviously a personality conflict. And, and looking at it where you know, these people are motivated by you know, checking things on a list. And these people are motivated by looking at the grand picture and, and having those people, there, there's gonna be a conflict between the two, but if you can realize, again, it goes back to empathy. This person is thinking this way and this person is thinking this way. Anyone else? Yes? Do you, you 
might have said this, but the, uh, some of the hidden flex in the contract, what would be something? So, um, all right, so with expression and you're building an expression in Insight, build the core, and you're adding like a robust search to it or something like that as an extra feature. Um, typically what we'll do is we'll kind of, we'll say, okay, maybe that takes 12 hours to build. We will price it at 14 hours because then we can say, we can give the client a little bit more flexibility to add a little bit of feature or design a little bit more. Certain things that makes more sense. Design is a really good one because you can, you can like, you can give a little like half revision or something like that. Um, again, you, you build that in there because you know people are going to want to change a little bit versus saying, it's going to take 12 hours. That's what we expect. That's what we charge them for. Well, no, tell them it's 14 hours. They're already expecting to pay for that. And then you can be a good guy. If you get under budget, you have that time. They don't even know it. And it's, a, it's instead of going back and asking for money, it doesn't work as, as easily. <laughs> does, that, does that answer your question? Anyone else? Yes? You said the 80% rule. I use 80 for developer, 10 for QA, and 10 for project management. How do, how do you do your, your other terms? I do um, 80 for dev, 25 for PM. If they're a difficult persnickety client or if it's a committee, 30% for project management on top. Project management is always what we go over on. Communication, <laughs> meetings, all of that. Account for it. It's valuable. To me, it's just as valuable as the dev time, so I put that in there. QA, I think we're at 15% because we do um, typically on top of everything, I think, for QA. So let me, let me understand. So your dev says 10 hours for this, this task or this project? Yes. Then you do 30% of that? On top. Uh, on top, okay. Yeah, so if a developer tells me it takes 10 hours, I add 25% for, for PM and another 15% for QA on top of it, my total line item will be whatever that is, 14 or whatever. Math in my head. Yes? So um, I'm not always in charge, but I'm in on a team situation where they, um, they allow the client um, to be in communication with, um, with Dev and, yeah. oh my god. I mean, it ends up being a complete nightmare, and yet, this is how these projects on a regular basis, I mean, huge projects that are happening, that that's how, that's their MO, that's their, oper that's how they're operating. So that can't be successful, right? We, my, from my perspective, it's not. The developers are interrupted all the time and they're stressed. So I insulate them from that by saying, Client's going off the rail, client doesn't understand, or we need to have a meeting to strategize or whatever, it's scheduled. At 10 o'clock, you're getting on a call with this client. They're not, you know that that's happening in our morning scrum meeting. You know this is what's going on. Sometimes that happens as, like a, as an emergency situation, but it's controlled access to the developer. They don't get their phone. They don't get their email. They get the project coordinator. Well, they, they're, using, they're using like Slack or, you know. So I don't use Slack for my... <laughs> Not with clients. <laughs> put them in on the, maybe the final end of the project, but then the project gets, you know, completely more, oh my God. It balloons when you do that because the client is like, what about this? What about this? I had a client, we launched a huge e-commerce platform for them and they were like, why did we pick this platform again? Yeah, it's a nightmare. I was just yeah. wondering if, if you just literally do not give. We do. Our project coordinator is like, no, you can't have their phone number. No, and if you figure it out because you saw their email on something, they, our developers are instructed to redirect. Our project coordinator can answer that so much faster than you can because she checks her email all the time, and I just don't get to it. So we insulate them, and it's, it's a battle because they, want, they think, if I get that access to that developer, well, the last time we did that, developer told you you were an idiot. <laughs> so we, we try to protect both parties that way. People want Slack until they get it, and then clients are like, I don't really understand where what's going on. We, we try not to do that. Slack, I think, is good for development teams to, to sort of get ideas. But as far as client communication, I've not found it to be very effective. Yes? What's your advice for managing um, email chains where I am constantly <laughs> on an email chain where somebody will say, oh, I'm looping in so-and-so here. 
And then the next thing you know, you've got this email chain with 20 people. It depends on really what it is. Um, for our projects, when they get to certain milestones, we're like, okay, here is a smart sheet. We use smart sheet technology. You can also use a Google spreadsheet and share it, where you can add comments. Everyone is privy to it. And we actually add a column for who's responsible. So sometimes our project coordinator has to take emails and put them in there. But there's a line item for each problem or concern or issue. And then you can say, Brian, check that off. It's done. We're waiting on the client to tell us if that's good. We're getting on a phone call because these don't make any sense, or these are all related to the same problem. We've got to figure a different solution. We sort of take it out of the email when it gets to that point and either have a meeting, a call, or say, all right, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to catalog this some way that makes sense because it's all going to get missed when you're doing that. And you can just add parties. That's what we do because the emails just, it does. It gets, it, it does, absolutely. Thank you.